Good evening. Welcome to Accelerated Ortho for General Practitioners. This is an international webinar, part three of three, um, by Brian Gray. That's me. And um, I'm welcoming the people that are joining us. Um, I'm, I'm honored to have people from around the world on the webinar right now, uh, including some people from the Middle East and from Asia. And I appreciate you being up late to, to watch this. So thank you very much. Um, just a a little bit about uh, about me, real quick. Uh, this is just my, my bio slide. I don't think really anything on there is important other than I practice full time in Washington, DC. I usually teach on Fridays and um, otherwise I'm in the practice. We have a cosmetic restorative practice. It's fee for service and we're proud of, uh, of having worked hard to get to that point. It's a very difficult thing I think nowadays to, to be able to do that. Um, the way I started teaching was I, I began by doing a lot of uh, product evaluation and clinical research. And we look at a lot of products in our practice, generally somewhere between uh, six and a, about 12 at any given time. And they last for anywhere from single use to uh, multiple years. We've got a 15 year study going now on one of them. And with that, uh, I think it's equally important that I share uh, this slide, which is um, just my non disclosure slide. I'm not employed by any dental company. I don't know stock securities or interest in any dental company, and no one in my family does. Um, but I, I do do, as I mentioned, I do a lot of uh, product evaluation, clinical research. It's a, a wonderful and fulfilling part of my practice. These are some of the groups that I, I evaluate products with recently, uh, and it's, it's been uh, you know, a wonderful part of the practice. The uh, material that I'm going to share with you tonight uh, is also available, a lot of it, in an article I wrote for Dentistry Today about three years ago in October 2014. It has about 63 or 64 references in it. So you're able to actually, I think, look into uh, detail into anything that's related to accelerated ortho, especially for the general practitioner, and really take a deep dive if you're interested in doing that. There's a number of challenges that uh, I think that orthodontists have, but also GPs in particular. And for us, it's, uh, I think, advanced case selection, the easy stuff uh, with especially clear aligners, which I'm going to be focusing on today, is uh, bread and butter. But uh, when we're looking at sagittal movements, class two and class three corrections, it becomes more challenging. The other thing is difficult movements, so severe rotations, intrusions, and extrusions, and cases where there's severe crowding. But probably the biggest challenge is shortened treatment times. Everyone's time today is precious. Uh, our patients, our time, our time with our family, our team members' time. And if we can make that easier, I think it's a valuable asset to share with them. So we're going to talk about ways to look at accelerated ortho. And I'm going to have a quick review of, uh, of these uh, right now, just covering some of the different ones that are out there to give you a quick update on what's going on. Before we talk about that, though, it's important to just understand some basic orthodontic theory. When you put pressure on a bone, I'm sorry, on a tooth in bone, uh, two things happen. You have a compressive side, which pushes against the bone. It causes resorption, and that's via osteoclasts. And then you have a tension side, and the tension side is where we grow bone via osteoblasts. Now, if you were to look at this uh, picture of a blood cell letting off uh, monocytes, which become macrophages, help to break down bone, it's part of a process of resorption that becomes then reversion, and then that becomes formation of new bone, and that remineralizes. Um, it's done with osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And when we look at bone remodeling, we can look at uh, tension, the tension side. I'm sorry about the dog here. Uh, look at the tension side, which is the side that it's pushing away from, and then the pressure side. And when we have the pressure side pushing against uh, the bone, you have a disorganization of fiber, decreased cell pro proliferation, and then fiber production. In order to understand that, I think it's important that we look at Burstone's three phases of force. This is from the 1950s, and it's, it's still a standard for considering orthodontic movement uh, in dentistry. There's really three phases when you put pressure on a tooth. There's the initial or strain phase, which is very, very short period of time when the initial force is applied, nothing really happens. You're just putting force on the tooth. And then we go through what's called the lag or hyalinization phase. And that's where uh, tissue is forming during a two to three week period, 
not much tooth movement is occurring here. This is where we're having a turnover of the cells associated with the tooth moving in the bone. Most of the movement occurs in the post-lag phase, which is a breakdown of the hyalinization layer, and then the osteoclasts are able to do their job on one side, the osteoblasts on the other, and in the post-lag phase, we actually have tooth movement. So if we look at that tooth again and look at the putting pressure on it via a bracket, you can see that bracket pushes against the tooth, and then the tooth pushes against the bone, and then the osteoclasts do their job breaking down the bone, and then the tooth moves. We call that frontal resorption, and it occurs on the pressure side, again, the compression side via vascular constriction, the breakdown of blood vessels. Um, it's important for us to talk a little bit about resorption, and this is oftentimes referred to as EARR, or external apical root resorption. It's caused by an excess of velocity. This is, um, used to be kind of a disputed point. It's not really anymore. It's uh, clear that, that too much force will cause this. We don't see this in any clear aligner therapy via Invisalign or any of the others. And the simple reason is you can't create enough force with the plastic before the plastic simply deforms. Um, a nice way to look at this is what I call a fence post analogy. And if we look at this now, we put pressure on this tooth. We do that. What ends up happening is, is if we put too much force, heavy force on it, it causes undermining resorption. And the way that that occurs is really the force doesn't look like that. It looks more like this. We have an arrow that pushes this way and another arrow that pushes that way. And down at the very base of the tooth, down at the very end of that fence post, you have some breakdown occur in the actual tooth itself. Of course, it occurs in the bone as well. The tooth is moving, but because of the excessive amount of force on that pressure side, there's a complete obstruction of the vascularity and it causes necrosis to occur, a breakdown. We end up with root resorption. The roots get short or blunted or literally break down. In a case like this, you look at this panorex and you can see that occurring in those anterior teeth. You see short, stubby roots. Sometimes you see uh, calcification of canals even. Um, but the bottom result, the net result is that um, there's very, very short roots. It violates Ante's law. It um, doesn't provide support. And in essence, it's a very weak uh, fence post. So. How do we how do we do this? How do we move the teeth? Well, the best phenomenon is to use regional regional accelerotory phenomenon, and that is to make the bone softer. If we make the bone softer, then we can move the teeth through the softer bone. This uh, again, getting back to the fence post analogy, this is the equivalent of trying to move a fence post through concrete or trying to move it through soft quicksand. Um, so let's take a look at this. If you take a look at this next slide here, um, sorry, take a look at this uh, next slide. We'll talk about the different um, orthodontic forces, uh, techniques to go ahead and to accelerate the movement of the, uh, the tooth through bone. And that's again, by softening the bone. First one that we'll look at is just the cyclic forces. Um, one of the first to come out was Excelident. Um, it was a device that was approved in 2009. The patient basically bites on a little night, uh, night guard or mouth guard, um, and it has a little computer that can download information, a little chip in it, and that's what it looks like in the mouth. The uh, patient wears it for 10 to 15 minutes uh, a couple times a day, and it helps to speed up the process. It does this by supposedly reducing the lag phase. It uh, results in greater movement by in essence, shortening that lag phase period. Another a method of um, accelerating the tooth movement is via pharmaceuticals. There's a lot of research that's gone on with this, um, either oral or injection of vitamin C and vitamin D metabolites, the use of calcitrol, corticosteroids, and, and many other compounds. There's nothing commercially available at this time, uh, but it's still being looked at, and NYU is looking at some, some of these right now as well. The next is light accelerated, light wave accelerated bone regeneration. And this was uh, developed by a company up in Canada in Vancouver called Biolux Research. Um, it's uh, basically using near infrared light to move, uh, to create something called uh, photobiomodulation. And the way that it works is in essence to create ATP, uh, which via the, the, photon, the photon, the osteopulse as they call it, it's a photon that goes in, stimulates the cytochrome C oxidase to um, 
aid in the movement by, in essence, generating extra ATP. This passed uh, CE standards in Europe in 2014. August 2015, it became available in the United States. Um, I, uh, I was on it for because I've been following all these different devices for a long time. I was the first to have it uh, uh, delivered in the U.S., and it actually took a long time just to get it through customs because they didn't know how to how to regulate it. Um, we got it in and have used it. Um, I have to say my results have, have uh, been um, not as, as good as I'd hoped they'd be. The next is a laser-assisted accelerated tooth movement, and this is often called LELI. Um, this is uh, something else that's had a number of research uh, projects to, to look at the ability of using low-energy lasers to help with tooth movement. There's no product available. I'm actually testing one there in the bottom right picture on my, my lovely bride. That's my, my wife. She's a dentist also, so she gets to volunteer for certain things, and we're trying lateral movement in a case like that. And then the, uh, the techniques that most people are familiar with, which are called decortication techniques. There's really three different ones, and we'll take a peek at them. Um, they all work by basically the same uh, idea. It's going to be to accelerate tooth movement by making the bone mushy. We make the bone mushy by actually creating inflammation. Um, we call it just a mild trauma um, that causes the transient osteopenia, which allows for bone healing. It was first developed by Thomas and William Wilco out of Erie, Pennsylvania. They came out with the idea in 1988. Um, oftentimes it's referred to as Wilcodonics or accelerated uh, orthodontics. Um, they've actually trademarked those names. This is from their website. It's showing um, uh, the typical Wilcodonic procedure here. They make troughs between the teeth. Uh, this is, again, not what we originally thought of moving segments of teeth. Um, which is more of a distraction osteogenesis technique. This is um, more, again, creating these big troughs and then having that inflammation all around the roots allow the entire bone in that area, the, the cancellous bone, to become soft and allow for tooth movement. Um, again, numerous different procedures are similar to this, but if it's accelerated osteogenic orthodontics or wilcodonics, um, those are trademark names. Uh, there's Pretty much any specialist can do this. Um, sometimes they'll just use a different name. Oral, oral surgically assisted accelerated orthodontics is one of them. Um, this is a technique we'll look at a little bit later on. This is a case that I, I did on a patient. I put these slides in there so we can look at it. Uh, but uh, here my um, oral surgeon is using a um, piezo type device to help create the dimples associated with, um, with the um, inflammation. Here he is packing some bone in. We'll talk about this case in a little bit. The second thing after uh, uh, Wilco is the uh, piezosurgical uh, tooth movement. And this uses ultrasonics. It's very similar to a striker saw or um, even your Cavitron. It um, uses a modulated frequency to help create vibration, which will be able to then cut into bone. Uh, the nice thing about it is there's a lot less heat and collateral tissue damage associated with it. Um, operators generally report a lot better control and precision. Here's a little piezo device, um, put clips down to be able to line up where the bone is between the roots and then go ahead and make a little incision and then stick the device in or you can actually just now put the device right through that without even making the incision. Then we put it in, you can see the depth gauge on the side of it to give us an idea how far down we're going to go and this again will create those little troughs of inflammation. There it is in action. It finally brings us to the, the technique that we're going to talk about today, which is Propel. Um, so why did I just go through all that? Uh, I think it's important for us to understand the history and the mechanism of uh, accelerated orthodontics to understand how easy this, this Propel device is. Um, I think this is definitely the most promising thing. It allows us to take uh, clear liner therapy and go from two weeks down to three to seven days. And we'll talk about that, especially with the idea of one week aligner change now that uh, Invisalign started uh, promoting uh, about six months ago. So it, it's really just a, a series of little drivers that we use to uh, go ahead and create dimples in the teeth. Um, I think the, the best way to explain this is that the mechanism for the corticotomy is the same, but it's, it's a much gentler movement. In essence, we're going to make Inflammation, we're going to do that by creating injury in the bone, and that's going to cause a cytokine cascade. 
and that will cause the bone to remodel. It increases bone remodeling and it reduces bone density. So we're turning that concrete into quicksand. If you make these little dimples, in, in essence, I like to think of them as little spheres, as little globes. They're about five millimeters a piece in, in, a, in uh, diameter uh, in each direction. So you can get an idea of how much inflammation you're going to create when you use the propel technique, uh, and you can be very precise about it and certainly not as invasive as some of the other techniques. There's really three different devices uh, that, that Propel uses. The accelerator is the original device. It's a plastic handle. It's the entire thing is disposable. I'm, I'm not really big on the uh, throwing out all the plastic like we do in medicine and dentistry. So I'm, I'm not a fan of the ecologically of this, but it's got some features that I really love. In particular, it's got an LED light I'm showing you right there that goes on when you reach this specific depth. And then this is a little retractable tip up on top. The next one they came out with uh, to, I think, help uh, appease those of us that wanted something that was a little bit uh, more ecologically friendly is the Accelerator RT, which stands for removable tip. Um, it's got a couple different tip sizes and styles. And you go ahead and you snap on that, that blue plastic part with the little driver on the top. And there's your retractable sleeve. It's got the depth gauge right on the side of it. And um, you just, once again, go ahead and screw it into the bone. And I'll, I'll show you that in a, in a moment. Um, there's also, which I didn't show you, I think I skipped over it um, for just a second, but there's also a, the uh, um, mechanical driver, which is, uh, I think, a, a great option. It's great if you've got a number of different spaces. And I think that, I'm sorry, but I think the slide may have, um, uh, I may have misplaced it. So I'll show you the mechanical one in just a bit here. But let's talk about how we do um, uh, the microosteoperforations, which are sometimes called MOP, M-O-P. First, you're going to just evaluate the area that uh, you're going to use, and you're going to just do a quick wipe down with chlorhexidine and wrench. Uh, we just have them swish out with it, and then we wipe the tissue itself. And then we're going to anesthetize. Lots of different ways of anesthetizing. Uh, but uh, we're going to show both of those. You can either use a topical only or you can go ahead and use a, a local anesthetic uh, via infiltrate method. After you've gotten them numb, you can go ahead and use the driver to create the holes with the original accelerator and the others. You can set the depth to three, five, or seven millimeters, and we'll show you how to do that and where. Uh, you just basically hold the driver against the tissue while uh, keeping that taut, the tissue taut. And then you, in a light clockwise motion, you just twist, and you're basically twisting a wood screw into the bone. Once the uh, light comes on, it tells you that you've hit your depth, and you just back it out, just uh, counterclockwise remove it. The, uh, here we are. This, the, this is the accelerator RT. Again, as I mentioned, it's uh, removable, so the... The handle is nice and hefty. It's a nice metal handle. It fits right in the palm of your hand, so it's great uh, and easy to use. We use this one for uh, generally if we're looking at making uh, somewhere between uh, 6 and 12 perforations. And then this is the, the PT, the one I was talking about, the mechanical one. It's a little motorized unit, uh, very similar to a TAD device or a portable handpiece, basically. And uses the same idea with the uh, uh, little small tips now, which is, uh, I think, very ecologically friendly. There's a tips in right in front of you there and the autoclavable head, and then you can do a cold stir wipe down on the handle part. Looking at that device uh, kind of in detail, it's got the, the top that's sterilizable, as we mentioned, and this is just the collar where it connects. Here's your stop, stop, stop and start button, and then you can control RPMs and torque right here, and you just go, forward and reverse with that as well. Um, so we just basically position this over where we want to go and go ahead and hit the button, drill down, stop when we hit our depth, and then hit the button for reverse and back it right out. It's uh, super easy to use. I love using the Accelerator PT for cases where I have a number of perforations I'm going to do, generally more than a dozen. I'll go ahead and do those all around the mouth. And I'll use that, I didn't mention it, but I'll use the accelerator, the first one, um, with uh, cases where I just have a couple teeth. It's uh, quick and easy, it's uh, sterilized, everything's set to go, so we'll just go ahead and knock those spots out quickly. 
So when I look at these instruments and I kind of think about the different properties, uh, the thing I like about the mechanical one in particular is that it's really easy to use. It's very intuitive. It takes just moments to, to figure out. You get great tactile sensation with it and it's well balanced. It's very lightweight and no fatigue. And then again, it's very eco-friendly, which I, I really like. If we look at the uh, original, I love the tactile sensation from this one. Um, it, again, fits firmly in the palm of the hand. Um, it's the first generation, so it's got that LED light I talked about, which I really, really like. And it's great for those small, quick cases. And then the, the one with the removable tip uh, has the same, but doesn't have the LED uh, light available with it. I really like it because it's it's got just this nice heft to it. It fits really well in the palm of my hand, and I can use it easily. Uh, so great for that kind of 6 to 12 range. That's where we like to use that one. Well, how many osteoperforations do you make? Um, I'm going to go back to our globe theory. I want you to keep that in mind. If you think about your globe and you look at between these teeth, these guys are going to be a little bit divergent. So um, a single dot here wouldn't affect these both these areas enough. So I, I sometimes will look at making a triangle. If the teeth are straight up and down, then I'll go ahead and make like a single line. Um, if it's a minimal amount of movement, I may make, just make one, sorry. I may make just one uh, uh, perforation or mop. And then uh, if it's more challenging movement, I'll go ahead and make two or three. So where do you perforate? Well, you want to perforate where there's cancellous bone, obviously. Now you're going to go through some cortical bone, and that's, in essence, all you're going to do is get into the cortical bone to create that inflammation. Um, you don't have to penetrate way down into this cancellous bone. You're just breaking through that little hard cortical thing, making a small dimple. And obviously the two things you don't want to hit is tooth or nerve. Uh, pretty easy for you to do if you stay in that area right between the roots. Um, I've never had an issue where I've, I've hit a nerve, and I'll talk about uh, when I've hit the periodontal ligament in a little bit. We like to track this really well. Propel makes a great sheet, and we'll get this ready a, ahead of time. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, kind of draw out where we want to do it for each patient via our pre-plan. We just get a little sharpie and fill out the spots that we want to get. If we're going to do repeated uh, mops, and we'll go ahead and, and list our second or third. I, I've only done a three, I think, a couple times. I'm going to show you one case, but um, generally I'll do one or two. Usually one is more than enough uh, to get things moving, especially if it's a single tooth. You look at the little diagram down here, and it's going to show exactly how to spread those out. Remember your five millimeter little sphere of inflammation that you're creating. Uh, the next is to have your checklist ready. and Propel has a really great little checklist that you can go for your tray setup and the procedure itself. It's got best practices on the bottom, which we'll talk about. Uh, one of the first things we'll do is go ahead and put some topical gel there. Um, I was uh, a little bit of a skeptic uh, with this at first, so I'd like to share this with you. Uh, we used to, I used to just not feel that I could get good anesthesia with the profound gel, as they call it. This is the same as Emla, which was originally used uh, back when they uh, first started doing laser hair removal, they'd use EMLA. And it's just a combination of lidocaine, tetracaine, prilocaine, and then phenylephrine. I found that the heavy-duty uh, version is better. It's got more tetracaine in it, uh, which is strong stuff. It uh, is made by a number of different pharmacies, and uh, you can screenshot that if you want, or I'll have it up it again at the end. Uh, but you, if you have a pharmacy that compounds, you can actually ha ask to have this made. The one downside also is that it's got a shorter shelf life, so I like to keep in mind uh, that it, it doesn't last as long as we'd like. Uh, what we actually go on to doing is using this instead of our regular topical now. We put this stuff on and then follow some steps to make sure we don't get tissue sloughing. That's what we're going to talk about here. What, how do you place it? You go ahead and just dry the tissue. This is, again, after having used the chlorhexidine. And then we'll, we'll put the, a thick layer of this on and wait about four minutes. After that, we suction it off, and then we wipe the tissue with some wet gauze and then rinse. The anesthetic has, has now penetrated the tissue, and it's going to do its job penetrating down into the periosteal layer. Um, but you want to make sure you wipe this stuff off. Uh, so after the four minutes, wipe it off, and then you, you've got up to 15 minutes total, about another 10 minutes before you actually need to get started. So 
this is uh, some of the compounding gel here. These are little gauze strips we cut, and then we just put that on the the uh, tissue prior to our procedure. Let it sit for four minutes. Take it off. Rinse. Wipe wipe down with some some wet gauze. If you do that, you won't have any sloughing that occurs. And uh, after you've done that, uh, you can go ahead and start your procedure. Again, you've got about. 15 minutes before you have kind of full anesthesia with this. So you don't have to be too much in too much of a rush. You just put this on. You can go ahead and uh, take care of any other procedures. If you're delivering clear aligners, uh, you may be having some IPR or doing some dimpling in the aligners themselves or something along those lines. Uh, it's a great chance to take care of anything else. Um, what we'll do is actually put this out and my assistant, since we have that sheet already, will know where I want to put it. She'll put that on and start a, a stopwatch and she'll go ahead and get it off and she buzzes me as soon as she takes it off uh, i know i've got 10 minutes to get in there then and to get started if you're uh, not comfortable with that you can go ahead and use local uh, anesthesia infiltration is really all you need it's important to understand that there's really no nerves in the cortical bone it's in the periosteal tissue and in the soft tissue so uh, we don't have to really have deep bone penetration with anesthetic um, we just like to get again get the uh, the area where the attached and unattached gingiva may be, and uh, just rem remember that the biggest advantage of doing it by local infiltration is that your PDL stays alert, and you're able to just have that additional comfort of knowing that uh, you're not going to ding a PDL. We generally we use septicane. I'm going to actually show a case where we use carbocane, and when you use carbocane and it doesn't have any epinephrine, you have to keep in mind you're not controlling bleeding at all, so you may have a little bit more bleeding. Uh, this is what it looks like after you've done some post-acceleration. Uh, we'll take a look at some of those dimples in just a little bit. Probably most important is uh, what we want to accomplish afterwards, uh, and that is to actually create these little small spheres of inflammation. Uh, the site may be tender for up to two days afterwards. Generally, it's just a day. Um, I've had some patients that I've actually used uh, some narcotics with. I've given them uh, hydrocodone. They, if they need it at all, they need it for a day, uh, and then that's pretty much it. Otherwise, I, I generally say, hey, it feels like you poked yourself with a toothbrush. Um, it's going to feel it in a number of spots. It'll be gone in a day. Um, what we want you to do is to take care of the pain, but by taking care of the pain, you cannot take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So, uh, in essence, ibuprofen would not work. Uh, Motrin would not work. That's ibuprofen. And Aleve would not work as well. So you've got to keep that in mind. Um, those are non-steroidals. Tylenol would be good for this type of situation. As a matter of fact, Tylenol is what we usually use and recommend. Looking over those three different uh, corticotomy techniques, if you do the Wilco te technique, it's very uh, invasive and it's time intensive, generally done with the periodontist or an oral surgeon. Um, maybe call it something different, but uh, it, it's a you know it's a major surgery, and the not only is there a lot of cost associated with it, but there's there's a lot of training. Piso is pretty similar to it. Um, it's a uh, quicker to be uh, to be able to do it. It's a lot less invasive, but nothing really compares to Propel that you see on the right there. Micro invasive. Um, we don't really need to have any prep time ready for the patient. It's very low cost compared to the others in particular. Um, the training is pretty easy. Uh, it's just uh, something that we can, you know, again, go over and practice once and then you're able to do it. Uh, I like to say see one, do one, teach one um, with this. Benefits to the patient in particular are that they're able to, I think the biggest one is that they're able to get up and go. They're able to go to work and school and whatever they need to afterwards. Um, they like the idea of being able to move things along and it's great for these difficult movements. For our practice, the patients love the idea that we've got something new and cutting edge. It's, again, been around for five years now, um, and we've really loved uh, the ability to use it. Uh, it refers to new patients to be referred in because of it, and it shortens treatment time significantly, which can reduce burnout. I really like that idea as well. Let's take a look at some cases now and kind of talk about uh, just how it works, and we'll look at the, some questions that I put together for us as well. This is Leo. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, anesthetize Leo with uh, some carbocaine here. So we put some topical gel there, let it sit for a little bit. This is, by the way, just regular topical gel. 
go ahead and give them some carbocane as infiltration across the top. We're looking for uh, some intrusion movement here on the severe deep bite in class two. Um, we're doing a full class two correction on him. Here we are using the uh, original accelerator. You'll see a little bit more blood than we normally have, but uh, I wanted to take pictures for you to be able to see what's going on. We just wipe the blood. You get a little drop. That's that's kind of normal. Um, you'll see here we really kind of left it so I could show you kind of worst case scenario, and we'll pay pay attention to this and just I'll talk about that in a second here. That little that's a tear that I, I did there. Here we are right afterwards. We wipe it. It stops bleeding right away, and um, finishing up with Leo. We're going to go ahead and finish our perforations, do a uh, just a quick wipe down. That's the same slide again. Sorry about that. And then here's what we look like again after we've done our perforations. So you see that that little tear. Probably one thing I I just warned you about. Um, I I was being a little aggressive here, and the amp piece slipped a little bit, and I. I made just a little tear there at the perforation which is a small perforation it was actually uh, when I was removing it healed up well uh, no loss of tissue or anything um, and it really helped to uh, move Leo's teeth along we'll look at a few cases now and just kind of talk about how we've used this um, Lisa was uh, came in to just fix her smile she had really kind of mild um, uh, orthodontic requirements and you can see here, she's got uh, there's a little crooked tooth here, but this canine was the thing that really bugged her, and she didn't like it, uh, number 22. And we went ahead and uh, developed a little clin check for her. I shared with her that in order to kind of move things along, get her ready for uh, um, uh, her move out west, that uh, you know we'd speed things up. And uh, this was early on, so we were doing two-week aligner changes back then with Invisalign. And this is what the uh, clin check looked like. So she had uh, 16 aligners. These are overcorrection aligners, um, which we didn't need. And you can see the attachments in place there. We did uh, the propel around this guy, and I did a little bit right up there to help see that we were able to speed things along. You can see there's a teeny bit of IPR associated with her case. Again, I didn't need the overcorrection aligners. And there she was at the start. Here she was. We did a little refinement. I wanted to get that canine in a little bit more. I was really happy with her bite. I won't bother to show you the clinch check for this. But uh, nice four-month case. Uh, able to get uh, things moved in, get her bite all settled. Uh, did a little T-scan afterwards to see that we had her bite nice and balanced. Uh, this is just the T-scan in action here, showing us how the teeth all come together and meet. A um, little bit of uh, more of a contact up here than I'd like right up on number nine. Um, but we ended up with, again, something that was really balanced. Uh, we did a little cooperation there, got her all set. Um, this is my sister, Maura. I'm going to share with you. She lives in the Midwest. I live uh, out in Washington, D.C. I hadn't actually looked in her mouth in, I think, 30 years. And uh, when I needed a board, a board lesion, which she didn't have, uh, she called up and said, hey, I broke a tooth, uh, maybe more than one. And uh, she had a break there, but uh, she, again, I hadn't looked in her mouth in years, and these are all a bunch of old fillings. Uh, she's got a nice smile. You're going to see that uh, because she could only come out and visit about every two months, uh, we wanted to make sure that the ortho was able to move along. We're going to do some a lot of restorative work. She's going to need some endo on some of these guys. Uh, so we uh, go ahead and follow this treatment sequence where we're going to go ahead and Provisionalize some teeth. She got an endodontic consult. We did uh, what I call category three, which is long term provisionalization. Then we did our final restoration, equilibration, and retention after the Invisalign. We did uh, a little bit of the uh, propel just to make sure we could get things to move along. Super easy case. This is core paste in here. That's a provisional material that I use. Uh, those are provisionals up top. So these are going to be turned into crowns where you see the white. And there she is uh, after we finished up. Uh, again, super easy case. Uh, when we were all done, got the teeth moved exactly where we wanted to. Um, nice and easy. It's great for this type of thing where you've got a patient that, uh, that travels to see you and you want to make sure things are going to move. Now, Emily's another interesting case. Um, sure, her teeth were very crooked when she uh, uh, 
got got married. Her pictures showed that she's got a, a very challenging class two, which she doesn't want to correct. We talked about that and gave her a couple different options. Um, you'll see here though that uh, this class two also has displaced canines, kind of seriously displaced. Uh, she's got wisdom teeth; they're going to have to come out. Uh, but she wanted to, she's going to kind of get right into baby mode. One of the interesting things associated with the uh, recession and the abfraction is that she had some smooth surface decay. Uh, so we went ahead and developed a ClinCheck for her. We developed uh, both the class two correction ClinCheck and uh, an anterior ClinCheck, keeping the bite the same in the back, although I will improve the bite, and you'll be able to look and see that um, to get the cusp foster relationship a little bit better. So there, there are those lesions. Uh, they're going to require some some composite. We're going to straighten things out for her. Uh, so we, with her goat, we went, uh, the, the aligners were two weeks each to start, and then at week six, we went to propel and changed weekly with it. And, and here she was at the start. We uh, got through the first set of liners. She ended up having the baby. She took a little break and then did some refinement afterwards and uh, just went ahead and did a um, uh, weekly change with her and were able to get the canines in line, as you can see. This is uh, just, again, T-scan. We'll take a quick peek at her bite here. This is a two-dimensional view. You watch as this plays out how we get things balanced. You can see we get things better, but I know I can get this even better over here. And when we first look at it, you'll see that little kite. What we're trying to do is get that kite right down to the bullseye. Getting it in the white area is great. That means you got the bite pretty balanced. We're um, obviously not on the front teeth in a situation like hers. But um, we're able to get those high spots corrected with uh, one quick more round of uh, uh, refinement and get her all done. Take a look here. You can see we got the bite. Up, sorry. We got the bite. Um, Nice and balanced here on the side now. She's nice and closed. And we take a peek at the T-scan again. This is afterwards. Got her all set. And you'll watch the T-scan play on the upper left there. It's uh, She's going into a bite phase right now. Biting down, you'll start to see that little flag appear. That shows our initial contact. And then after that, because we were able to move the teeth, we were able to get that bite nice and balanced for her. Uh, she was real thrilled and was able to send in a couple other patients, which uh, it's always a benefit. And one of the biggest things she was happy about was the speed at which we were able to give her a nice bite again. Aside from the wisdom teeth, she's going to end up getting a graft up there. We're aware of that. Uh, she probably need one maybe on the other side at some point down the road, but uh, we're able to get her nice and stable. So Suzanne's an interesting case. Um, her husband had uh, was ill with cancer, and she had to raise four kids by herself. Um, she got the kids taken care of. Her her husband passed away, and really kind of felt it was time to to take care of herself. And uh, in the meantime, her mouth had uh, really deteriorated. Um, uh, she had a lot of decay, and approximately she's missing some posterior teeth. Had a super deep bite. And uh, she's going to be a reconstruction on top. So this is kind of what she looked like up close. You can see a lot of old dentistry and decaying approximately. Um, on the bottom, the teeth are in good shape. She doesn't have a lot of decay down there. She's got some old fillings and crowns we're going to take care of. But our big thing here is we want to straighten out those bottom teeth and correct the super deep bite. Uh, you can just get an idea here how deep it is. Uh, she was 100% um, on her when she closed down in her overbite. Uh, our, our plan is going to be to go ahead and uh, take care of curious control. We'll get our records. We're going to use our Invisalign uh, SLA, our final model, as a guide for a reconstruction wax up. And then we'll take care of any endo. Again, we'll take care of what, we, what I call class or category three restorative treatment. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do propel because uh, we really want to move those bottom teeth. And the top is going to be easy. It allows me to, when we do this overlap technique, uh, to go ahead and do the reconstruction up top. Sometimes they'll go to a periodontist for period treatment, uh, but oftentimes we'll go ahead and get the top teeth uh, in the reconstructive mode. And on the bottom, we'll go ahead and uh, work away on our, our minor tooth movement. In this case, a lot of intrusion uh, to get things in better shape for her. And I can actually anticipate where I expect the bite to finish up. So as you can see, she's got that 100% overbite there. We're going to go ahead and move through our Invisalign. You can see us straightening out the teeth. We did uh, two rounds of uh, Propel with her. 
to help get some good intrusion. Here she is after we've done the reconstruction up on top. And uh, we're still doing a little intrusion on the bottom. You can see the attachments uh, still on the teeth in the bottom left side there. Top uh, reconstruction is done. And that's how she turned out up top, pushing down the teeth still on the bottom, to get those guys flat. That's just a close up of our ceramics, which we're really happy with. There she was. And there she is all done. She ended up moving out west. Um, we got the teeth nice and leveled for her. You can see in that uh, occlusal, mandibular occlusal shot there how we got those guys down. Would have loved to have gotten down another couple millimeters, but uh, uh, she was wonderful. Has actually sent patients to us from Arizona. Brett's a, kind of an easier case, and this is a great propel case. Uh, Brett's uh, very busy here in Washington, D.C., and um, in politics, and uh, wants to straighten things out. Uh, interestingly, he's got uh, fractions uh, associated with his, his bite. Um, so he's got some teeth that aren't in alignment, but the fractions are pretty obvious. And um, you can see them on the, uh, the canines in particular. And then there's, there's some recession on the molars. Uh, and we we'll want to keep that in mind. So we'll need some uh, little composites there. But if we get the bite more balanced for him, uh, we'll be able to help solve things. So we're going to go ahead and do some Invisalign, straighten out his teeth. You can see the, uh, from that mandibular occlusal shot, we're getting that lateral uh, in line. We just did uh, uh, propel in a couple spots uh, for him. We uh, did it on the um, that lower lateral, and we did one on the upper lateral as well. Get the teeth nice and straight, even, and Brett's all set. So there's that recession, just as pointing that out, that we'd end up probably having to do some grafting afterwards. We got the bite super stable for him, and he was thrilled with how things turned out. Justin uh, is, uh, you saw that case earlier when we were looking at uh, kind of some advanced accelerated techniques. Justin had a 37-year-old male, good health, and he had bad odor coming out of some bridges. These bridges were uh, mixed Maryland bridges in the anterior. We, he didn't have laterals when he was younger, so they uh, made some nice all ceramic bridges. They're, full coverage on the two centrals and uh, wings, uh, rest seats on the canines. Well, typically, as we know with the uh, Maryland Bridges, they debond, and what happened was both six and 11, the canines debonded and ended up getting decay underneath them. Um, you can see the bridges here, they're nice again, nice bridges, but there's a significant amount of decay where these guys have broken loose. So uh, we discussed the different options with them. He said he'd like to have implants, and we thought that'd be a great idea. Now. He's got a, a big deficit of bone above where those laterals never came in. So we're going to have to actually build that bone out before we can place implants. And we shared that with him. He was good. Uh, that was until I actually took a look at the x-rays. And that was a, a bummer for me. You can see from these shots here that what had actually happened, because the laterals weren't in position, that the canines came in convergent towards the midline. And they corrected this, um, the, that... Uh, big distal root uh, angulation by making the crowns straight up and down, leaving the roots uh, with a non-axial inclination on them. So unfortunately, that becomes something where I can't put implants in right away because there's no room. So uh, we came up with an interesting plan, which we uh, figured the accelerator would be a good uh, uh, time to use this and use it not just to speed up uh, the tooth movement, but also to help create enough inflammation, make that bone mushy around both the centrals and the canines to help upright those, uh, again, to give them a, a nice axial inclination. And then we'd be able to place some implant crown, implants in place, implant crowns, Emax crowns on eight and nine. And, and on the canines, where he had the decay and had the rest seats, we're just going to do some bonding. Um, those guys are in good shape. So we'll get those all set. And we'll actually restore a little bit of canine guidance with his uh, two lower canines as well. It's uh, great to be able to work interdisciplinary with this type of case, uh, work with your oral surgeon. We do a lot of planning with it. We looked and saw that we weren't able to place the implants the way we wanted to. So uh, we came up with a rather unique uh, plan, and this is uh, how we did the Invisalign for it. It took uh, uh, a number of go-arounds, actually four, to be able to get the teeth the way we wanted to, but uh, uh, trying something new, and we had a pretty nice result with it. I was uh, pretty happy with how it turned out. I'll give you an idea of uh, exactly what we're going to do in just a second when this opens up. 
And um, here we go. Clincheck's opening. So what we're going to do is we're going to upright those centrals and the canines, and we're going to do it by a lot of root torque. So you're going to watch these guys straighten out. And my goal was to take these pontics and literally drive them down into the tissue to create an ovate pontic space and actually help to create papilla so that we'd be able to, uh, when we were done, put in some nice implants. Here's the clincheck as we play through. And you'll watch the tooth movement up front. Again, two separate bridges. So what we're going to do is um, go ahead and drive those guys distally at the incisal edge. And that's going to give us that mesial root torque on the centrals, pushing that uh, pontic up in. What we did is we cut the wing off on both of the canines. Um, let me show you this view cut the wing off, and we put bonding on these spots here. And now these are cantilevers. So these cantilevers we use to drive down into the tissue and help create that ovaponic space. Now you can actually look at the procedure itself. You can see the attachments in place. And what we did is uh, we used a few different devices. I'll show them here, but the plan is real simple. We're going to drive those guys so we can get mesial root torque and we get distal root torque on the canines. While we do that, we're pushing that pontic up into the soft tissue there. And the place where we're going to have contact is going to be right down here. So you'll see me go in a number of times to go ahead and open up that contact between eight and nine. This is when I was working with my surgeon, or uh, my oral surgeon, Robert Emery. Uh, he's now going to prepare the uh, sites for implants. So he went ahead and did this piezo technique to create some inflammation and then went ahead and packed bone in. Uh, and then sutured it back up, and we're just going to continue right along. We uh, moved the um, liner changes up to every two or three days. He was coming in uh, about every two weeks at this point, and here we are just moving through as we drive those guys up. Right after surgery there, you can see we got nice thick tissue. Um, now, uh, actually, he's healed from the surgery. And we're going to go ahead and use the propel to, in these areas to help keep that, that movement going. So I'm going to, in this case, um, twice, I went ahead and placed four, uh, 14 points of uh, little mops here. And you'll see that I do it around each of the canines. And then I did it around the centrals. And when we did it around the centrals, again, the idea was to drive those centrals towards the center. So uh, we're going to do the mops right there. And the idea is that those roots look something like this in there. And by doing this, we're able to take those roots and move them straight, create room for the implants. Um, I've got a kind of a better diagram here. I just uh, actually tried to make a tooth. This is as best as I could come to making a tooth. And you can see us just uprighting that. Both of those guys would upright so that we'd end up with enough space. Um, once we got those guys straight, then we could go ahead and place the implants. And uh, we can go ahead and do that in just a moment. Here we are just uh, continuing to perform that IPR in between those teeth. Got enough good bone now. We go ahead and have got those guys driven down. And we got space to place implants at this point. So go ahead and put the implants in. Here they are, the implants in place. We use guided surgery techniques so that we weren't uh, uh, in danger of dinging the periodontal ligament on either side. We're able to get those guys nice and straight. There they are in place. Here he is with his provisionals on on the top. And here he is uh, after we've completed it. So. The uh, minor tooth movement, as far as like straightening the crowding on the bottom, was super easy. Didn't need really anything. What I really wanted to do was create that cytokine cascade around those centrals and around the canine so I could drive those guys back and end up giving him uh, a nice smile, one that he, he really likes. So here we are with two uh, Emax crowns on the front. This is that placement. And um, he's got two Emax implant crowns on the laterals, and then just a little bit of bonding on the canines. 
uh, ended up with a really nice result. Justin was thrilled. Uh, he's been stable now for about four years um, with a great result. Uh, Propel also came out with a cyclic device uh, to uh, I think, uh, be able to have it against to use it with the against the competitors. It's called the V Pro Five. We first were able to use this a couple of years ago. It's very similar to other ones that use a vibratory technique, and this is a great way to help with um, uh, compliance to help move things along. So use it for five minutes a day. Um, we ac actually ask our patients to try and use it two or three times a day. Use it in the car when you're driving, uh, when you're walking your dog, whatever it might be. Um, it's FDA approved. It's a little oscillator. It's got uh, the same thing. It's got a downloadable flash drive on it, basically a little computer that you can uh, put all the uh, data in, which I think is really great. This is just the directions for it. Um, it's got a really great light system on it, too. I like this. It tells us when it's charged and, in essence, uh, when the patient's using it. It tells you when the battery's low. And uh, the software that we get from it's great because it helps us to give an idea of how the patient's doing as far as compliance is concerned. Super easy to assign a patient uh, uh, the device and be able to have them use it. And if they are using it, um, once they've, if they've been assigned a device, uh, you can track how well they're doing. And if they're not doing well, you, you get a report that, uh, that kind of tells them that they, they need to be using it more because it's got a log of not just the time, but the duration, which I think is a, a really nice little thing that helps them stay on track. Um, a lot of great patient materials for, for the VPRO5 as well as the Propel technique, which kind of brings up uh, not just the marketing, but I think um, actually being able to kind of share this stuff with patients. So. Uh, it's, you know, I think the first thing is it's an FDA registered device. It's compliant 501k. Um, and probably the nicest thing I like about it is it doesn't have what I call a suicide pill. Uh, some of the other devices out there um, literally are designed to, to die after a certain period of time. Um, this doesn't have that, which I think is great. It's got a, a one-year warranty, which is good for patients. You generally don't need it that long. And it's got a guarantee for you, the doctor, uh, for two months. So we're able to use that to help stay with the uh, tracking. Now, um, how do we use that kind of uh, currently? Well, I'm using it on all my clear aligner therapy cases. Um, we start them out at uh, our patients out at two week wear for our first three aligners. And I originally did this to honor burst on spaces of tooth movement. You remember that lag phase is, uh, takes a couple weeks for us to actually start the bone breaking down and allowing us to get to the post lag phase for movement. So I originally did it for that, um, and then kind of realized that probably pushing uh, pushing them weekly uh, right from the start would work. But um, we we do that more to just check with compliance now. And if the patients are good and compliant, then it's easy for us to go down to that one week wear, which patients are excited about. And we use the V Pro Five to help stay on track. So. Um, there are factors that affect speed. We will always share that with patients. There's really kind of four things that affect the ability for a tooth to move. It's the amount of force, the amount of space, compliance, and the amount of science that we, we use to with it. So I, I kind of discuss with them that uh, the difficult movements will derail the case, but the probably um, bigger thing is not enough force, uh, not of space, obviously, but not enough force is the number one thing. So this helps with uh, creating the force. And then, of course, if the patient isn't compliant, the case of derail, go off track. So this is great for having us be able to stay on track. So I put in some questions, and we'll, well, I'll take some questions afterwards. But uh, how do I introduce Propel? Well, with uh, with any procedure, you know, I think it's important that everyone's scripted and on the same page. You know, we make sure we do an informed consent with them, and uh, you know, discuss going back to the uh, mop technique. Just discuss that this dimpling, dimpling is mildly invasive, um, and cover all the side effects. Basically, which is just going to be soreness. Uh, but the trade-off for just being sore for a little bit is that we're able to get really great movement, excellent clinical results, and the case moves right along. Uh, what about violating the periodontal ligament space? I, I kind of started the lecture talking about that. I did it probably on the third time I used a Propel device. I went ahead and dinged a periodontal ligament. The patient knew right away, man. They jumped. Um, I was concerned. 
I'd already done a lot of literature search, and probably the best literature available on this is uh, from the TAD use when you when you're using um, any uh, small anchors for either ortho or for implant placement, and it, people dinged periodontal ligaments for a long time via that. Uh, we we know that uh, if you basically just back out of there and let things heal, they're going to be fine. It's uh, going to be sore for a couple extra days, um, and you probably won't hit a periodontal ligament space again. One of the techniques we use is what I call floss between the teeth. We just take the floss, um, put it down into the contact, and then pull it straight down. It gives us a good idea of where the root is. We'll uh, always verify that by looking at the uh, full mouth series as well, just to make sure there isn't a dilacerated root. How about managing that, uh, that pain afterwards? We talked about that. You can really only use acetaminophen or paracetamol, you know, Tylenol type products or analgesics. Um, they are not anti-inflammatory. If you have a patient that um, that you know is maybe a, a more anxious or more pain sensitive, then we'll go ahead and use one of the acetaminophen oxycodone combinations, Percocet, Vicodin. Uh, those work well. Uh, like all of us, I'm very wary of prescribing any narcotic these days, especially ones that could possibly develop opioid abuse. So if we do, we just give them a day's worth. Uh, they don't need a whole lot to be able to. Uh, control the pain, it's, it's gone within a day. How about post-op infection? I've never seen post-op infection uh, with the propel technique. Uh, mops are super minimally invasive. There's no need for antibiotics. We just do the tissue wipe beforehand, rinse with the chlorhexidine, and that usually takes care of it. Uh, probably the bigger thing is, you know, uh, how about the, the intervals uh, changing? Uh, well, uh, we switched to going to every seven days when we first started using Propel, and then Invisalign basically uh, uh, switched from two weeks to one week with close monitoring the cases. This this alone in itself is uh, a very interesting thing. As an instructor for Invisalign, I can tell you that a lot of people get into trouble by giving too many aligners and then having a case go off track, and you can't backtrack. Once the case goes off track, you got to reboot. So. The, the key for that is to just look in um, your tooth movement assessment, the TMA as they call it, in your ClinCheck. If you've got the latest software, it shows up as a blue or black dot. If you have a blue or black dot, that tells you it's a tooth that's got challenging movement. It means the value of the amount of movement that occurs is within a range um, near the high end of what is expected to occur with the aligners alone. These are great areas for us to be able to propel. and. Once again, I usually do it about every three months. Uh, we used to, we were doing a little less than that at eight weeks, and now three months seems to give us that, that little sphere of inflammation long enough that we can get those challenging movements and get them to follow through. Any contraindications? This is my own list. Uh, when I wrote that article, I kind of went through everything that I could think of that might be contraindications. There wasn't really anything available at the time, but the obvious ones would be immune to bleeding disorders, patients that are really anxious, um, ones that require prophylactic antibiotics, which is an issue in itself because generally that's not a something that's necessary. Um, I just uh, we can talk about that at some other time. Um, someone who's taken bisphosphonates, uh, Fosamax is one of them. All the others may be a candidate for not doing it. Um, uh, have yet to see any uh, Bron J, as they say, uh, the bisphosphonate induced radio osteonecrosis or osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, but uh, best to play it safe. And if, they've, if they're on those medications, then they probably would be a good candidate. If you're taking anti-inflammatories for arthritis or something like that, that may be uh, something that precludes you from being able to do it as well, because that's going to be giving an anti-inflammatory effect. And we want that cytokine cascade. We actually want the inflammatory effect uh, around the teeth themselves. And then previous radiotherapy to jaw cancer patients probably would be a good uh, uh, candidates for it as well. Well, how do you charge for this? Uh, there's really kind of different ways you can uh, build it in, which is what we do. We don't charge extra for it. Um, uh, the VPRO device and the, um, and the MOP procedure itself are, are so cost savings for me as far as time is concerned that it's just worth it. Um, so, you know, if we've got a patient that's compliant, and meets all the other things that we talked about, uh, we'll go ahead and offer it uh, if they've got any challenging movements or they've got a lot of crowding. Another way is to, to build in a, a flat fee. You could um, charge it as either a reduced time option or each time you use it, charge for the, the device or the technique itself. Same with the V-Pro 5. 
Um, I think that kind of the cool thing about uh, Propel is it's helped to change my orthodontic practice. Uh, I've been able to, to speed up the cases significantly, especially if you're doing reconstructions. I found that it's wonderful to help move patients along while you're taking care of other, uh, other stuff uh, along the way. Um, with that, I want to thank you. I'm going to open up for questions. One of the challenges I had um, when we got started was we couldn't hide my little control panel here, which you'll be able to see. Uh, so I'm going to just open up the question uh, thing and see if we got questions. I can see, uh, see some up here. So let me um, see if I can drag this out. Um, the question by someone was um, Invisalign and changing aligners. Let me just open this up. Here we are. Sorry. Um, we'll start up at the top here. Uh, do you propel your anchorage teeth? And uh, the answer is no, I don't. Um, not sure. That, that's a great question. Um, the reason I don't propel the, uh, I don't use propel on anchorage teeth is generally the anchor teeth aren't moving. Now, uh, this uh, again is a very interesting thing because uh, this got really thrown on its ear, the idea of anchorage, um, when Invisalign came out with their G4 and G5 update back in October of 2013. Um, and the idea behind that is that they started using what's called reciprocal anchorage. And that means that uh, it's kind of hard to show here, but uh, I can explain it. That just basically means that they're now looking at leveraging the movement of one tooth to act as an anchor for movement on other teeth. And this is going to become standard uh, in the near future. There's an exponential change going on uh, with clear aligner therapy. Invisalign's still the 800 pound gorilla with this because they invest so much in their research and development. But by using you know, teeth that are actually moving as anchors for other teeth has really changed the game. So if I look at uh, teeth that, that are um, anchorage teeth and they're not moving, then I don't do any propel around them. Um, what happens if by chance I go five millimeters in front of the teeth instead of three millimeters? Um, well, I, you're still going to be okay. Think of that sphere of inflammation. Um, you know, look at where you're at with things and where you're going. I'm sorry, one of the things I didn't really cover is kind of the depth, and I uh, kind of flew through this today. Um, so I'm going to hit that real quick. The idea behind the, the depth is that you want to, again, penetrate that cortical plate. Well, up front, it's a little bit thinner, and obviously in the back by the molars, it's thicker. We've used Propel a lot for uh, molar uprighting with, uh, with uh, aligners. It's uh, still a real challenging movement. It's a challenging movement with uh, fixed. Uh, when I do, when I, I used to do segmental, I don't do any fixed ortho anymore. I'm uh, clear plastic only. And um, it's a challenging movement. And it's not challenging just because you're trying to upright, but you're actually torquing those teeth. So if you had, say, 19 or 30 out, if lower first molar, we know what happens. Teeth want to touch. So you get super eruption of the upper molar, and you get a tilting, mesial tilt of the second molar on the bottom. So pushing those guys back is more than just pushing back. You're not tipping. You're actually torquing that tooth. You're getting mesial root torque and uprighting it. But it also has occlusion against it, which is pushing down at the same time. We found that a way around that for those types of situations is that we'll use the ramp tech, the ramps technique, the ramps on the, the aligners in the front to help separate uh, and give us more room to be able to get good uprighting. Uh, so we've had good technique with that. Um, what, what do you suggest if a t patient takes Advil by mistake? Uh, had patients do that, uh, nothing to worry about in a situation like that. Um, Natasha, the idea is just have them stop right away. It's going to decrease the effectiveness if they take uh, any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, but they take it once by mistake or a couple times. It's going to you know, do what we don't want to do. It's going to stop inflammation, which reduces the cytokine cascade. In particular, the thing about ibuprofen is it's really great at uh, osseous penetration. So um, it actually is defeating the entire purpose. So we're just we're really clear about just having them use the Tylenol. And then your first question he asks is, what do you suggest? Uh, uh, hang on. Um, what you suggest to do if a uh, tooth movement, complete movement, you ever use? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. I hope I answered that question, the very first one there. I'm looking at it right now. If you want to ask it again, I'm not sure if I did answer that. 
do I have any concerns about doing MOPS in mucosa? Um, the answer is no. Uh, you could actually see on Leo, we we do it both attached tissue and and in mucosa, Keith. Um, so it's uh, uh, you know it's where the cortical plate is and where I want to create the inflammation and where the nerve is and where the periodontal ligament is. I don't want to hit the root or the ligament. I don't want to hit a nerve. So I'm conscious of that. I'm not worried about going into mucosa. Obviously, the place where I'm going to be real careful is around the mental foramen. Um, also, have I heard about five-day liner change when doing Propel? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, the key with, uh, with doing this is that you need to just uh, pay close attention to um, the, the movement. And, and I, my uh, experience is that we usually see the upper anteriors go off track first um, when, we're, when we're doing a, a quicker change. Uh, but I think the key is for you to take a look at um, uh, any tooth movements uh, in particular. Um, if it's a blue movement, as they say, uh, it gives you an idea of whether or not you may struggle with it with Invisalign. It just blue means that it's going to be more challenging. Black means it's very, very challenging. Um, and if you follow those rules, I, I think you'll have great success. You can again see on um, on Justin's case, we were changing every two and three days uh, to really drive those teeth. We wanted to keep a constant, um, gentle force pushing on those teeth at all times. Um, which is why we moved through those aligners. All the tooth movement after we got the initial stuff was just on those front teeth, the, the canines and the centrals, and we ended up with a nice result. That takes us to about 10 after here. Uh, I hope I was able to answer all questions. If you have any others, please, please feel free to send them in to Propel, and I'd be happy to answer them for you. If you get out to Washington, D.C., and it's uh, Monday through Thursday, please feel free to stop by my office. I'd love to have you see how we use anything we talk about uh, in lectures, I like to have you see how we use it firsthand. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, having uh, you as part of the seminar tonight, and I look forward to seeing you on our dental journeys around the, around the world. Thanks, and have a great evening.